Hi, I'm Paul with Boaters Exchange in Rockledge, Florida in New Smyrna Beach. Today we're going to be talking about safe trailering and just some best practices regarding trailering, uh, launching and retrieving your boat. So just a small disclaimer, by no means is this the full list of all the things to consider, but these are some of the things over the years that we've learned and uh, we're actually going to be referring to some of our internal training documents to um, help us with some of the process that we use. So a little bit about Boaters Exchange. We are a full service boat dealership, two locations to serve you. We're a five star certified dealership with Yamaha. Uh, we also are NMMA certified. So that's the National Marine Manufacturing Association. We received their sort of good housekeeping seal of approval. And we've been named one of North America's top 100 boat dealers for I believe 11 years in a row. So let's start talking about safe trailer. So today, for our demonstration purposes, we have a 2021 24-foot Pathfinder. It's a TRS model with a T-top. And uh, I would speculate the boat and motor combination, uh, boat motor and trailer combination, uh, weighs somewhere in the range around 5,000 pounds. So one of the first considerations is going to be, you know, is the tow vehicle uh, obviously have enough tow capacity? So you'll want to pay attention to that. Um, today we're going to be towing with a, uh, an F-250 Super Duty diesel and I know the tow capacity is uh, far in excess of what our boat uh, and trailer weigh, um, but obviously you don't want to be undersized on your tow vehicle um, and uh, the way it was explained to me was it's not so much can the tow vehicle pull um, the boat uh, rig as much as can it break the, uh, the, the, uh, the boat rig. So braking is really the bigger concern when you're towing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's a factor is, is the tow vehicle up to the challenge? Um, the second thing is obviously gonna be, is the trailer ready to tow? Um, and the biggest concerns on the trailer are typically the, the rubber and the, uh, and the hubs. So just taking a look at the trailer tires real quick. <clears throat> What we would typically do is check for tire tread. Um, and do we have enough rubber? Also, are the sidewalls in good shape? Um, fatigued tires tend to have uh, cracking on the sidewall. And the thing to know about trailer tires is that um, the biggest concern on trailer tires is typically, do they have enough sidewall support? Well, they, they do have extra sidewall support. so. Trailer tires, unlike car tires, have a lot more plies on the side of the tire um, than, say, a, a regular vehicle tire. So that's why you really want to check and see: do we have any uh, spider cracks or, or cracking in the tire? If you're making a if if you're making a long haul, say down to the Keys or something, that can be a real problem once those tires get hot. The next thing is going to be, you know, are the uh, hubs in good shape? Are they lubricated correctly? Um, and I won't get into how to lubricate the hubs, but uh, the key there is are the hubs in good shape? One inspection that can be done to make sure that the hubs are not on the verge of failure is actually jacking the trailer up. And what our techs do is they will check for side play on the tire. And if there's side play, it's typically an indication that the bearings on the hub are in the process of going bad. And that can really ruin a, a long trailer trip when your hub goes. Um, typically our Pathfinders, uh, we try to order them with a spare tire and a spare hub. So, um, so those are always, it's good always to have obviously a spare tire, a spare hub, and the gear you're going to need to change the tire. Another factor on tire um, failure that I've noticed over the years, it's not uncommon when one tire fails for actually two tires to fail. I don't know what that is, but it could just be something about the extra load on the, the last remaining good tire if it's a tandem. But there's, it's not uncommon for tires to fail in tandem. So if you are taking a long trip, it's not a bad idea to have two spares. Just some uh, uh, pointers there and that could be overkill. And then of course, you know, overall are the axles in good shape? If you have leaf springs, um, are the leaf springs, um, you know, rusty? Uh, if they are rusty, it's not always an indication of uh, leaf spring imminent failure because spring metal, spring steel will corrode 
um, much more quickly than regular steel, and that's just part of the design of spring steel. So what you can do to check that is just kind of tap it and see, you know, is the rust becoming structural um, when you're doing your leaf spring inspection. But obviously in our case, we've got a brand new boat, so the trailer is in good shape overall, uh, and so are the tires. Now, if the trailer is equipped with brakes, um, it adds a whole nother level of checks to our system, right, to our, to our process. So we're gonna take a look at the trailer actuator because this trailer is equipped with surge brakes. Um, and incidentally, in Florida, any trailer that has an overall gross rating of uh, 3,000 pounds or greater, by law, if that trailer sold new, it has to come with, uh, with, with brakes on all axles. It doesn't mean you as a consumer that owns a trailer has to have brakes on all axles. It more, as I understand it, is applied to the trailer manufacturing in Florida. I could have that wrong, but it's definitely um, something to check out. So in our case, we've got four wheel disc brakes. We have a um, trailer actuator with what are called surge brakes. So the way surge brakes work, and this is uh, often you know, not understood by people that haven't had trailers with brakes. The way surge brakes work is the, the actuator has a master cylinder built into the tongue of the trailer. We call this the actuator. Once it's connected to the vehicle, um, as the vehicle is applied, uh, as you apply brakes in the vehicle, the actuator, uh, the tongue will actually slide back inside of this actuator. So this will slide back as the weight of the boat surges forward because you're applying brakes on the tow vehicle. When that occurs, the master cylinder um, will compress and push brake fluid back to the wheel cylinders and apply um, brake pressure to the brake calipers. So all that implies that there's brake fluid up in the master cylinder and that's something that needs to be checked. Do we have enough brake fluid in the trailer actuator, the trailer tongue actuator? If you don't have enough brake fluid, you're going to have air in the lines, you're not going to have brakes on the rig. So on this trailer, um, there's a little cap here, and if you can kind of zoom in on there um, to check the brake fluid, we would simply pull that cap off, and on this one there's a little rubber cap, and you can see that we've got brake fluid right up to the top. And that's just standard old, what they call dot three brake fluid. And you wanna make sure your brake fluid is topped off. And in this case it is. So we know we have good brake fluid. And, um, and we'll just put that little decorative cap back on. Um, <clears throat> let's see, another factor with trailer brakes that sometimes trip people up is that um, the connection on a trailer without brakes is what we call a four-way flat. Uh, that means that there's four wires, a ground wire and three lighting wires for um, running lights and blinker lights and brake lights. But on a trailer with brakes that has surge brake, there's actually a fifth wire. And the fifth wire is connected to the reverse light on the vehicle. So um, in our case, the trailer manufacturer is using what's called a seven-way round. Um, but the seven-way round is actually just five pins, a ground wire, the three light wires, and then what's, um, and then the, the wire that disengages brakes when the vehicle is in reverse. So when the vehicle's in reverse, your reverse light comes on, that same circuit will um, be used to power the fifth wire. And when that fifth wire gets energized, it engages a, I'm gonna say a solenoid, um, I believe it's a solenoid, but basically it shuts off the flow of brake fluid when the vehicle's in reverse. And that way, if this actuator compresses whilst in reverse, the gauges aren't gonna, uh, sorry, the brakes are not going to engage. Um, and why that's important is because you don't want those brakes to grab when you're trying to roll or back the boat uphill or, or back it up at the ramp. If they do, because of, say, for instance, a blown fuse in the tow vehicle, or, for instance, if the fifth wire is not making good contact because of old metal, um, they're typically, um, some trailers will have an override. So this particular trailer does have an override, and it's hard to show you from this side, 
but that override is this little insert right here that I can go take around to the other side to show you on the other side but it goes basically in this little notch and it keeps this um, actuator from sliding back and that's what we call a mechanical override that gives you the ability to back up um, if your fifth wire is for some reason not working. And one final thought on the trailer connectors is that oftentimes a point of failure on the trailer lights on the trailer is typically these connectors having um, corrosion on the metal prongs, whether that be on the, uh, the truck side or the trailer side. So a, uh, a way to overcome that is if you do have the corrosion is to just take a, a blade, uh, like say a pocket knife and just scrape the metal fresh. Um, that sometimes will help. Uh, and then as a preventative step, you can put dielectric grease in this uh, trailer connection. Um, another real common scenario is that um, some of the newer trucks will have fuses for all of the trailer light connections in the fuse box. And I've seen it a number of times where the fuse is blown um, and that is causing a, a failure on trailer lights. So just a couple things to note about that connection. Okay, so one of the great reasons for me Want, or us wanting to do this video is all the mistakes I've made in hitching. Um, but uh, one of the, uh, uh, actually my brother told me way back when I first got my, uh, when I got my very first boat, he said, when you begin the hitch process, don't get interrupted. Whatever you, whenever you start the hitching process, finish the hitching process um, because it's easy to miss those steps in the middle. Um, so don't take a phone call or let someone walk up and interrupt you. Just really try to focus on what you're doing. Um, if the uh, hitch isn't done correctly, obviously there's going to be trouble. But um, the first thing is to make sure that you have the correct size ball. Um, uh, I've had cases where, you know, we use too small of a ball for the hitch and that's a big problem, obviously. So this is a two inch ball. Um, uh, hitch and we have a two inch ball down here. There's three ball sizes. Um, there's the one and seven eighths, which is hardly ever used anymore. The two inch, which is considered standard for, you know, most boats, I would say up to about 26 feet. And then the two and five sixteenths, which is the larger size ball. The next thing to know is that there are different weight ratings on the balls themselves. So a two inch ball can have, as an example, a 6,000 pound weight rating or a 10,000 pound weight rating. It has to do with how big the shank is. And the ball mount itself, what we call the ball mount itself, can have a max, does have a max rating capacity. So you really wanna make sure that everything over here is rated for the size boat that you're towing. In this case, I've got a 10,000 pound hitch and a 10,000 pound ball, so we are in good shape. Or, sorry, 7,500 pound ball. So therefore, next step is when we're lowering the, um, the boat down, you wanna make sure that the latch catches correctly. And let me just get this down here real quick. I've found that um, it's usually better to have the ball a little bit further forward in the pocket as you're lowering it down, and it has less chance to catch the tongue uh, that's underneath that sort of comes up when this is closed. So um, put the ball further forward in the pocket as you're backing up. As you lower it down, if you notice this latch begins to rise up, it's because that tongue that's underneath or the little catch underneath that you can't see is not wrapped underneath the ball. So that would be an indication that there's a problem. But in this case, it lowered down nice and fluid. We've now got the, the tongue jack up. I like to get it up all the way out of the way right now so I don't forget to come back and do it later. Um, if the wheel's trying to spin on you, you may have to hold it with your toe. But uh, you're gonna bring that uh, winch stand all the way up. If you go over a hump or something, that wheel can catch. So I like to bring that sucker all the way up. <clears throat> and then over here, as we latch down, the first thing we're going to do is latch that down. Um, it's got a nice smooth feel and a lot of times I'll just reach underneath there and make sure that that uh, latch underneath is tucked under the uh, slope of the ball. 
Next step is going to be to put in uh, the safety pin. Now, depending on the trailer, the pin can either go through this, through this opening here, or in some cases, there'll actually be an opening here to put it in, and it'll tell you which, which style you have. But in our case, it goes through the latch up top. If that pin doesn't go through the latch up top, it's an indication that there's something wrong. So if this latch is kind of up like this a little bit, I cannot get the pin through there. But if I've got it all the way down, um, and this is kind of, this little lever here is caught underneath, and that pin goes through, and you feel under there, it's latched correctly. During this stage of the process, I'm typically checking to make sure that the, lat that the trailer hitch pin is in place, um, that my uh, little clevis pin here is, in, is, is, uh, is connected, and I don't have any problems there. Then I've got this item, which is the trailer brake actuator, emergency brake actuator. So I'm just gonna take this, connect it to my trailer hitch. Um, what this does, if you have surge brakes, you're gonna have an emergency brake lanyard, and that's what this is. So for some reason, this whole coupling comes apart. Um, hopefully, this will be the last ditch effort that will engage the brakes on the trailer and keep the boat from careening and injuring somebody because the brakes will be applied. So you wanna have that connected. Um, and by the way, it's real common for these to get accidentally deployed. If you see that this has been pulled out, um, you have to bring it to a dealer to go have your actuator serviced. Once the emergency brakes get, um, get um, engaged, it's gotta be reset and in some cases replaced. So you wanna make sure that. <clears throat> and then, of course, we got our chains, um, which in my case are cables. Um, the, the proper way to do it is to crisscross um, some, a lot of people don't crisscross, and I have to admit, sometimes I don't. The advantage of crisscrossing is if for some reason the trailer couple, coupler comes off and this trailer drops down, um, it has a higher chance of catching, the cables have a higher chance or the chains have a higher chance of catching the trailer tongue to keep it from dragging down on the ground. And then the last step, is going to be to connect our trailer lights so that just goes in there like that and I've got a seven way round so at this point I want to kind of just double check what did I forget and um, typically it's the latch pin or the winch um, <clears throat> so that kind of finishes our connection here for safe trailering and now what we're going to do is we're going to go make sure is the boat ready to tow um, is everything else ready? Because this is just the first step. So let's go check out the rest of those items. I'm going to start with, um, with the trailer winch. And what you want to do is make sure that the, the, bow, stra uh, the bow strap is connected. Um, if that bow strap is nice and taut, you're in good shape. I want to have the safety chain on. There's real common for that safety chain, someone forgot to put it on. Uh, I had another case where not only was the safety chain not on, but the clicker was not engaged on the, on the winch. So because of that, um, the, uh, you know, the, the strap was sort of sitting there like that and it looked like it was tight, but in fact it wasn't. And with the latch being off, I had the boat slide off the trailer on me, okay, um, when I was uh, pulling out of a stoplight. So you want to make sure that this is tight, that it's not frayed, and that your safety chain is on. And then the next step is going to be making sure that the boat, as I said, that the boat is ready to tow. There's two, there's really three common mistakes. Um, loose items left in the boat, whether they be cushions, um, life jackets, some other things that you didn't know were left loose in the boat. That's, that's a real common error. Another one is by accident that the VHF antenna or some other item on the hard top was left in the up position 
Um, typically when you're leaving the boat ramp, a lot of times, you know, if you had a couple of beers or something and you don't take the time to really inspect everything, you can accidentally pull out with the VHF antenna. We've probably replaced, you know, 50 VHF antennas over the years from people accidentally leaving those up. Outriggers often are left in the up position, all kinds of things. So you gotta make sure the boat is ready to tow and I kinda just do a walk around. And then the third real common mistake is leaving the engine too far down. So if the engine's in the vertical position and the skeg is real close to the ground, then you're potentially gonna snap that skeg off and it happens all the time. So you wanna make sure that the motor's tilted up um, so that you have enough clearance on the lower side of the motor. All right, great news. We're all hitched up. We've done our safety checks. I'm ready to put the car, the truck in drive and, and get ready to go to the ramp. But I have a policy and that is when I'm about to put the car in drive, um, I always ask myself, did I double check everything? And that's the point when I get out of the truck and I go try to, and I go look for what I forgot. And I actually literally will do another walk around, check everything a second time. What did I forget? Once I've done that last check, then I get back in my truck, drive down the road.